and we're going to have a wonderful program on the Great Florida Birding Trail with Liz. And Liz is the director of Appalachia Audubon. She is the coordinator of FWC's Great Florida Birding Trail, and she educates Floridians and visitors about Florida's wonderful wildlife. She's worked in the ornithological research for nearly a decade. She earned a bachelor's degree in evolution, evolutionary biology from Harvard University and a master's in biology from Virginia Commonwealth University. She has had the pleasure of working with leeches, storm petrels, Florida scrub jays, cerulean warblers, golden winged warblers, and her favorite, prothonotary warblers. So I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to let Liz go ahead and share her screen. Hey, um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight. Um, let me see. I'm usually a Teams person, not a Zoom person. So hopefully everyone can see my screen right now. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, so I'm the coordinator of the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail with FWC. Um, you guys have probably seen the signs around with a swallowtail kite. Um, and as you said in the introduction, all of my background before this job was in uh, wildlife biology and other kinds of research. Um, and when I found out that there was a job in FWC that was in the wildlife viewing section, it sounded like a dream job. <laughs> um, and it really also is. Um, so first I wanna start with just why FWC has a wildlife viewing section. Um, I mean, we mostly focus on our hunting and our fishing, but there are a few of us who get to work on this. Um, so our mission as an agency is to manage fish and wildlife resources for the long-term well-being and benefit of people. Um, and sort of historically, especially when we used to be the Fish and Game Commission, um, that has to do a lot with hunting and fishing and managing those resources. But as we're seeing more and more people move into this non-consumptive model of enjoying wildlife, um, we're becoming more and more important as this wildlife viewing section. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about why wildlife viewing itself is so important. Um, as a researcher, for me, one of the big things is that it creates data. Um, so a lot of folks I know use eBird, probably a lot of you have your eBird accounts. Um, and this, this is actually about a year old, so it's probably a lot more than this right now. But as of a couple of years ago, there were 420,000 active eBirders around the world. Um, and they'd reported 590 million bird sightings, um, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and 220 scientific publications have come out of this uh, data set and use this extensively. Um, one thing that you can do with this kind of data is to look at range maps and look at abundance of these species. Um, so here I've hidden the name of this bird for the range map, but you're gonna see as I play the animation how they travel during the year. So we're starting here in January with a higher abundance down here in Florida, um, up in the Midwest and down in Texas. And then as we move through the year, we can see that they're migrating all the way up north into North Canada, and then returning down. And then the animation freezes, but that's okay. You see where it's gonna go. Um, and then of course we have this one population that's resident here in Florida. So I can't see the, oh, I can see the chat right now. Oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, um, does anyone wanna guess what it is in the chat? Which I can't see. <laughs> I'm guessing that some of you have also- We're, got we're, we're, we're on, oh, um, James said whooping cranes. Close. Alan said sandhill crane. Yes, yeah, so this is a sandhill crane. Um, yep, sandhill crane. So you can see how it's moving over time. And first, number one, this is a really cool animation to have. They're just really fun to look at. Um, there's a lot of fun ways to play with the data. Um, and if you're a birder, you can use this kind of thing to figure out what times of year you can go out to see different things. Um, but as a scientist, it's also really important because you see what areas they're utilizing. So if you see a lot of birds in this area, you wanna be sure that you're protecting habitat for birds in those areas. And you can really target spaces that need to be conserved more effectively. 
Um, this data can also be used for important conservation action. Um, so one good story is how this eBird data was really important to list Rufa red knot as a subspecies that was threatened, which of course gives it extra protections. Um, you can imagine if you're a scientist working in ornithology, you don't always have great funding sources. Um, you're not really rolling in money for that kind of research. So you can't hire a ton of technicians to go out and do these kinds of surveys. So having, was it 420,000 people who are helping you collect this data is an invaluable resource. Um, this is one thing that I did when I was in graduate school, just a quick little project, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I could use the data to look at the times that this species, black burning warblers here, were arriving on their breeding grounds or arriving in North America. Um, you can see down here in Florida, they're starting to arrive orange here, April 23rd, and they're getting up to the northern part of their range by the end of May. And then I was able to relate that back to some climate variables. Um, and so looking at predictions and climate change, you can see how the range, uh, the timing of migration might be shifting. Um, so if the temperature to, to rise on average uh, by 3.7 degrees, you have a huge change in the arrival times. Um, so here in Florida, we'd be getting them as early as April 15th. And that doesn't seem like a huge difference, um, but a lot of these birds are relying on other things that are sort of happening at the same time as their migration. So they might have insects that are emerging to eat. Um, some birds might have flowers that are blooming that they're following like hummingbirds. And so if those plants are using a different cue, um, something like sunlight that would stay stable over time and the birds are showing up at the wrong time, that's not gonna be great for them. Um, so this is just sort of a lot of things that you can do with this data set. Uh, another example of how wildlife viewing creates data, I don't know if folks are familiar with the iNaturalist app and the iNaturalist database. I see a little bit of nodding. Um, and I saw one of the photos that you guys had in the slideshow earlier was from iNaturalist. Um, but if you guys aren't familiar with the app, I would highly recommend it. So it's, it's sort of magical. Um, all you have to do is upload a picture of any wild animal, um, any plant, any fungi, and then the community and the image recognition software that it has will help you identify it. So they compare that to their database of all these things that have already been identified and it uses its machine learning computer vision magic um, to help you understand what it is. And it also takes into account location. So if that thing has been seen in that area, it says it's more likely to be that species. Um, and so you can get a pretty good ID just based on that but then it's also kind of a social network. So people will come in who know what they're talking about if you don't know your ID super well on something like plants and they'll either confirm it or uh, tell you what the correct ID is. And it's also really helpful because oftentimes people will come in and they'll explain um, why it is the thing that it is. So it's not just telling you that you're wrong. Um, it's a very friendly community. Um, yeah, so really you just have to snap it on your smartphone. And if you're out of service, you can always upload it later as well. Um, so in addition to being really cool for identifying things and learning a lot about what's around you, it's again useful for biologists and for uh, conservation managers. So this is an example of a project that was done in South Africa in iNaturalist. And what they did was they just asked folks to go out, snap pictures of plants, and add them to this project in iNaturalist. Um, so anytime someone found an invasive... <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, any fun time found when someone found an invasive species, the people who were, wanted to eradicate those knew right away before it could get out of control. So it's a really cool program to catch things like that. We at FWC are also using iNaturalist projects. Um, so for all of our wildlife management areas, we've got 47 lead wildlife management areas across the state. We have a project. So we can see everything that's cited there. So again, we have not a ton of area staff on these areas, um, but having people who are going out and collecting this data for us is so helpful to just know what's on the property and see trends over time. Um, so here, I think this is split oak. Um, and this again was about a year ago that I put this together. I need to update these. But then we had 4,000 observations on that wildlife management area, um, 816 species that had been identified and over 500 people who were identifying and really just 100 people who had been starting to observe or um, entering observations, but 100 people with 4,000 observations, you can tell there are some people who are really committed to using iNaturalist. 
Um, okay, so my background, of course, is in biology, and I love birds. So it's enough for me that this uh, wildlife viewing is helping to contribute to conservation. But not everyone necessarily sees the world like that. Um, for some people, it's really all about the bottom line. But the good news is that wildlife viewing is also good for the economy, um, which is something that I've learned a lot about in this position and was completely awed by the facts that I, when I first learned them. Um, so this data is from 2011, the most recent time we've done a comprehensive survey on wildlife viewing and economics in Florida. Um, but in that year alone, wildlife viewing in Florida generated almost $3 billion. Um, if you compare that to the orange industry, I think actually all citrus, they only generated $1.2 billion. Um, so I would argue that our standard license plate should probably be something like a Florida scrub jay instead of an orange. Um, but of course, again, I am quite biased. Um, another really great fact from that study, there were 45,000 jobs supported in that year by wildlife viewing and tourism, um, which was more than the airline industry in Florida. Uh, really an incredible statistic. Um, so again, almost $3 billion generated in a single year. And this is great for a conservation incentive for folks who aren't so conservation minded on their own. It's also great for uh, rural economies because a lot of these places that have great wildlife don't necessarily have those other income generators related to tourism, like the theme parks or the beaches that are drawing in people. Um, so it's really great to help those areas out. And the other thing that we've learned over the last year and a half, sort of unfortunately, um, is that this industry is resilient in times of crisis. Um, so when we had people who weren't able to, to visit as much and to go to these other attractions that Florida is popular for, people were still going out birding. In fact, they were birding more than they ever had before. Um, so this is an article from the New York Times. The birds are not on lockdown and more people are watching them. Um, it was wild to see how much sales of things like kayaks, canoes, binoculars, tents um, increased over the last year and a bit. Um, I know friends who are trying to get kayaks who had to wait a month and a half because they were all in back order. Um, so while that is very frustrating, this is a, just another example of how it's really important to the economy, especially in here in Florida. And then the, the other thing, the big thing I think about wildlife viewing is that it gets people to care. Um, because if you're out there and you're having these experiences with wildlife, you're automatically going to become an advocate for them. Um, you can't see a bird like a prothonotary warbler and not really fall in love with it, I don't think. Um, so people who are wildlife viewers are some of the most passionate advocates for this wildlife and for conservation in general. Um, we, we need passionate advocates. Um, this is the most recent statistic I have on this, but the state population is expected to double by 2060. Um, we've got a thousand people a day who are moving to the state. And unfortunately, that of course means that there's predicted development of 7 million acres of land. Can you guys see when I move the images around or the video around on top of the slides? Can I get a head shake or head? Okay, because <laughs> I'm moving it around a lot to look at the slides, just wanted to check. Um, yeah, so with that predicted development of 7 million of acres of land, you can see this orange area that's expanding expanding, it's all the more important that we have folks who are promoting conservation. Um, and of course, the sobering statistic that came out a year, a couple years ago from Cornell Lab of Ornithology and others, that almost 3 billion birds are gone since the 1970s, which is really just a staggering statistic. Um, so the question here now is, we love that people are wildlife viewing. We love that more people are getting involved in it. Um, but we really need to think about how we create the next generation of wildlife lovers. We need to get more people involved, um, young people involved, more diverse audiences involved as well. Uh, because they really are sort of our canary in the coal mine. Um, looking at bird populations and having folks who are looking, uh, who are recording all of this data, we can see based on that, um, how ecosystems as a whole are sort of faring. Um, so, so what I work in with the Great Florida Birding Wildlife Trail is really sort of an ecotourism position. Um, and so people think different things when they think of ecotourism. Um, some people might think of something like a big cat rescue um, as a form of ecotourism. 
some people think about it as something like an elephant rescue where you can go up and interact with these animals. And then of course here in Florida, some people hear the word ecotourism and they automatically think of things like Gatorland um, or other roadside attractions. Um, zoos perhaps are an ecotourism thing. Some people might think of it. And of course they do a lot of important work in terms of conservation and in terms of education. But here in FWC, the way we interpret ecotourism is that it's responsible travel to natural areas, one of the keys there being natural, that conserves the environment, sustains the well-being of the local people, and involves interpretation and education. So it really has to have all of those components in it. Um, one of the big things is that it is feeding back into the conservation of these lands and these species. Um, so with that, the Great Florida Birding Wildlife Trail. Um, so our mission as a trail is to um, conserve and enhance Florida's wildlife and habitat by promoting wildlife viewing activities, conservation and economic opportunity. So it's a whole lot of things sort of under one belt. Um, we have our iconic Florida birding trail road signs um, that are directing folks to over 500 sites across the state. We have all kinds of different partners on the trail, uh, national wildlife refuges, national parks, our incredible state park system. They're some of our most wonderful partners. They're really wonderful people to work with. And of course, stunning natural spaces, um, but everything down to even smaller county, smaller city parks, um, and even some like privately owned lands and college campuses. So really any place that's good for birding and wildlife viewing. <laughs> Um, we also produce print and online resources for folks who are interested in birding in Florida. And then occasionally we also get to do some educational programming. So birding trails. Sometimes you, uh, the Florida birding trail isn't necessarily the most intuitive concept. Um, if you Google it, you'll find one single location because when people think of a trail, they think of a place to go out hiking. But of course it's more of a guide to places across Florida. Um, the first birding trail in the United States was actually in Texas, um, and their first trail was their central coast um, back in 1996. And so sort of the way this was implemented, it is that it was designed as a series of driving loops, so a little bit more trail-like than the Florida birding trail is right now, but it suggests that you sort of start in one place and gives you a nice itinerary for that area. Um, and these days the Florida birding trails or the birding trails can be found in 36 United States um, and also some provinces in Canada. Um, so if you're traveling to any other state, I just go ahead and Google it because they have great resources. We work with a lot of these folks in our working group for wildlife viewing and nature tourism. And it's just so fun to see what these different programs are doing. Um, if you're going to Texas, I would also recommend ordering this map. Um, they have one of these for each of their birding trails, and they're not only informative, but just really beautiful pieces of artwork. Um, so the Florida birding trail was hot on the heels of the Texas birding trail. Um, the initial planning started in 1997. Um, and the big infrastructure thing that we maintain on the trail is the signs. Um, so originally we got a wonderful, almost $2 million grant from the Federal Highway Administration um, and we still have wonderful partners at FDOT who help us with all of the installation and replacement, making sure that the signs are still up to code and reflective. Um, but we have over 1500 signs across the state. Uh, so it is sort of an endeavor to put all those things in together um, and they have to be replaced every 10 years. Um, but do they really matter is something that we've been asking ourselves recently. Um, because now we're sort of living in this age where people are more online. Most people navigate using GPS. Um, so they're beautiful and iconic, but we wanna make sure that we're directing the state's limited resources in a good direction. And it turns out based on a survey that we did that they actually do. Um, so 72% of the people who responded to our survey have made impromptu trips based on the road signs. I know that I've done it myself. Um, sometimes while I'm on my way to be somewhere, um, and then I end up being a little bit late, but I can't resist when I see the swallow-tailed kite sign. Um, and 83% of the folks had planned future trips based on the signs. So if you're on about, keep your eyes peeled and hopefully we'll help you find a hidden gem. Um, when this trail was originally organized, um, they were done in clusters. So everything within one of the clusters is about an hour driving distance from each other. So unlike Texas, it's not really a set route or itinerary but it gives you an idea of what's there if you're, if you're planning to visit an area. 
So this ice on the trail, as we said, all of them, of course, baseline are selected for excellent birding and wildlife viewing opportunities. We wanna send people to the best of the best that Florida has to offer. But the other thing about the trail is that we have sites for all interests and abilities. So some people might like a more curated experience. Um, here we have St. Mark's. Um, and of course, St. Mark's has wonderful, nicely maintained trails, a wonderful visitor center, interpretive staff, lots of programs. Um, and so that's great. I mean, it's great for everyone. I would highly recommend a trip to St. Mark's. But it's also, it's nicer for folks who are sort of getting into it or who like that slightly less wild feel still quite wild. Um, but then there's other places like our wildlife management areas. Um, and those oftentimes have almost no facilities at all, but might be a great experience for someone who really wants to get off the beaten track. So we have all, it runs the gamut, what we have on the trail. So whatever kind of experience we're looking for, hopefully there's something there for you. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, a lot of print and online resources. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. Okay, and then I'm going to start sharing again. Okay, um, so if you guys are interested in checking out our website, um, we have a number of resources here. We have basic descriptions of all of our trail sites. If you visit here, um, our our trail is divided into four sections, four quite large sections, the Panhandle, West, East, and the South. You guys are kind of in the middle, so I would look at the East and the West if you're looking for places around home. Um, and one of our other things that is really helpful on here is our trip planner. Um, so if you're interested in looking at a map and scrolling around to see what's close to you, you can click here. Our house Wi-Fi will eventually bring up all of the birding trail sites that are near you. Um, and you can go ahead and click on them. It gives you a brief description of each of them. And you can also search by other things. So places that have that are accessible, um, places that offer camping if you're interested. Seasonal hunting is of some interest to people who have um, interest in consumptive uh, wildlife enjoyment as well. Um, and you can also search by what we call the top 30 birds. So back in the day when the Florida Birding Trail was first being organized, there, were, there was a survey that saw what species folks were really interested in seeing when they were making trips to come visit Florida. So these are our sort of our creme de la creme that we identified people as being interested in. Then we'll return. Uh oh. Aha. Um, and here we have some exciting news. This is actually the first announcement that we've made outside of the agency about this. Um, it's going out in our social media tomorrow and then next week through our newsletter, but we have brand new physical copies of our birding trail guides. Um, so we have these for each of the four regions. There's some nice hefty books that offer hopefully a, a lot of information, but they have every every site with its description um, and as well as maps of each site. Um, some also helpful information in the end note and of course the place where you can take some field notes. Um, my favorite thing about these guides is that they are completely free. Um, so I'm just, I just love handing out things that people can use, especially when they don't have to pay for them. Um, so I will share a link. Hopefully I'll be able to send that a little bit later um, or I can pop it in the chat later um, where you can order these publications and we will just mail them to you free of charge. Um, we hope that everyone really enjoys them. And if you do happen to get one of the birding trail guides, there's also a link to a survey at the end. Um, we'd really appreciate feedback so that we continue, can continue to improve products for you. Um, of course, all of our trail sites have a highlight on the website, just a brief description and a photo. Um, and we always really appreciate it because we're only a few people on the ground. If you happen to be visiting one of these sites and you notice some kind of glaring error, um, something that's been damaged or lost or some exciting new thing that uh, potential visitors might really enjoy, you can always contact me and we'll get that updated right away. 
We also offer a newsletter monthly and we have about 42,000 subscribers. Um, we usually have public interest stories, trail highlights, a listing of events um, every month, and then sometimes other announcements, science spotlights or species spotlights, just kind of a fun thing to read. So if you're interested, you can also subscribe to that under the Kite Tales tab on our website. And I also wanna let you guys know that if you have anything that you're interested in publicizing as an organization or, or is something else that you've heard, some exciting news piece, we're always happy to help advertise that both through our newsletter um, and through our social media. Um, so we have our Facebook page and our Instagram page, of course. There's been talk of a TikTok as well, but um, all of us are slightly too old to really know how that works, so we're still learning. <laughs> Uh, we occasionally get to do presentations and programs throughout the state too. Here's me and my coworker, Travis Blunden. Um, we got to present on the birding trail and wildlife viewing in general at a trip um, where we were presenting to some teachers so that they could learn some more information to share with their students. These are relatively few and far between, um, but we do love getting out in the field to interact with people one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, we also, perhaps not so much of a service as a shameless plug, but we've recently started a Florida Birding Trail store, um, which you can also access on our website. And we've got some really fun stuff, I think. I should have brought my mug. Um, I have a very boring one today, but we have mugs for the Great Florida Birding Wildlife Trail. We've got fun t-shirts and stickers. And uh, actually, again, this is a first announcement, but we are just released a new line of items from our featured artist. Um, her name is Sam Wayman. Um, she's based in Gainesville. And she makes these really, really fun, whimsical art pieces. And she's allowed us to use some of this work for our products. Um, so I, I purchased one of these t-shirts and I purchased a pillow and I've gotten a mug too. And I really like all of them. So if you're looking for any kinds of gifts um, or something to spice up your wardrobe, feel free to visit and check our products out. One other thing that we do um, in our wildlife viewing section this isn't necessarily related to the birding trail, but it's a fun program that I always like to share, um, is the Wings Over Florida program. So this is a way to kind of get more people involved in wildlife viewing. Um, it's a very sort of a, a fun, rewarding way to get into it. So for people who are keeping lists, we offer certificates when you see certain milestones. Uh, originally, the program was just for birds, but now also includes butterflies. So you can get your first certificate um, with just 10 butterfly species or 25 bird species, and then the numbers go up from there. Um, 300 for birds is our maximum, so we challenge folks to get there. I'm certainly not there yet. Um, and this course, all with the goal of increasing engagement. Um, we're always looking for new partners who can join us in Wings Over Florida. Um, so you can apply for certificates online at any time by yourself. But if you're someone who's already leading bird walks or butterfly walks, and you would like to give these certificates out to people, perhaps for a beginning birder class especially, um, you can get in contact with us and we can give you those things to hand out to your participants. Um, and I put Travis Blunden, who I showed earlier in a slide, he's our Wings Over Florida coordinator. Um, so I can put that contact information in the chat as well, and it'll be available here in the YouTube video. Um, but he would be happy to hear from anyone who'd like to be handing out those certificates. A couple years ago, we also started a big year, which I really enjoy. Um, we get a new piece of artwork every year. Um, a while ago, it was Blackbird and Warbler this year's. Bird is going to be the black-bellied whistling duck. We just got our artwork in and it's really beautiful. Um, and then our butterfly is going to be the red admiral. So however many species you see, we'll send you out a certificate um, with your name and the number of species that you saw. So you can frame it or just hang it on the refrigerator. Um, and we also have big year buttons. So we're hoping that people will enjoy collecting those year after year and challenge themselves to beat their previous records. Um, so looking forward, what we're hoping to do with the birding trail, we've got a few different projects. One of the things, of course, is that we're trying to focus on newer audiences. We are always trying to grow the base of wildlife viewers. Um, so we're targeting, of course, younger folks. Um, and it's so exciting to hear that you guys are doing a Young Birders Club. I can't wait to hear more about that. Um, and then, of course, more diverse audiences as well. So when we host events, um, we're 
working with some of these groups like feminist bird clubs, outdoor Afro, Pride Outside, and Latino Outdoors, who are already have sort of an audience. Um, and by linking up with them, we're hoping to provide them resources and give them some fun opportunities to get out and about. Um, one other thing that we're planning, I mentioned that we have all different types types of places on the birding trail. So places that are a little more curated, um, comfortable and places that are a little bit more wild. So we're gonna be coming up with a way to rate those and rate them um, so that it's really easy to figure out. If you're having a lazier day and you just you really just wanna drive around, it's hot and you wanna look out the window, that might be a low wild factor. And if you really feel like hiking five miles into the wilderness, you can find one with a high wild factor. Um, we're also working on putting together some guides which are oriented more towards tourism. Um, so in an area that's sort of a major hub for tourism already, we're gonna come up with some quick and easy simple guides that just describe the area around those tourism hubs. Um, and of course, we're hoping to get some of those folks who might come for a week at Disney and find by day five that they need to get somewhere else. Um, so they can pick that up at their hotel or at a visitor center. Um, and our big new thing for this year is that it's been a long time since we've added any new sites to the trail, and there are definitely more places that deserve this recognition. So in November, we will be opening up nominations. Um, if anyone is interested in nominating a site that they're particularly fond of, um, I can happily add you to our mailing address so that you can see what that entails as the process moves forward. And of course, again, it's places that have great wildlife diversity, ease of access, so it's not too tricky to get in or closed all the time. Um, and then one of the big things is that with wildlife viewing, we don't want to be pushing people towards places that are particularly sensitive. Um, so we try not to uh, send more visitors to places with a very low carrying capacity because we want to stay responsible with our wildlife viewing. Um, so that's what I have for you guys tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little bit more about what we do in FWC in our wildlife viewing section. Um, but if you guys have any questions, I would be more than happy to take those. I think we have a few questions. Go ahead, go ahead, Susan. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Actually, um, Pat was wondering if you could repeat how to get the guides. And I can type it right into yeah the chat for people. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I don't know if I'll have to pull it back up, but let me pull up the link to the FWC publications page. Okay. And actually, this is fun because well, A, I'm very excited that people can now order our Florida birding and birding trail guides. But if you go to this page, this is also where you can find a lot of other publications. So we have things like bird checklists, butterfly checklists, um, some really nice paddling guides that um, someone who just sadly just retired with us had put together, um, which give great information. Um, and then we have recreation guides to all of our wildlife management areas as well. Um, most of them totally free of charge. Fantastic. And um, I think one of the questions we had earlier was how to add um, a, a location, but I think you pretty much covered it. And that is to contact you via email to get on to the email listing for that. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So that was one of the questions. Um, and someone, Bob had asked, what is the status of the Great Florida birding signs for the wildlife drive, Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive? I don't know if you so, know about that. Oh yeah, so Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive is part of our east section. And I actually just delivered a batch of signs to all of our maintenance partners in the east region. So they should be going up shortly. Um, and I'll be reaching back out to them just to make sure that everybody gets them up because they are really helpful um, maybe not so much in navigating that now that we all have smartphones, but in figuring out what's there. So hopefully people will say, what's, what's over there and look it up. Great. Um, let me see. Physical books. I think we kind of talked about that. Okay, my cat just stepped on my notes here. I'm sorry. Oh, and there was a question. Can you repeat the person who is doing the artwork for the t-shirts? Her name? I'll put her website in the chat as well. Thank you. I also want to Google it because I want to make sure I'm spelling her name correctly. There we are. Um, so she does a lot of wonderful work of both Florida native species and she also really likes pets. So she'll do things like custom artwork of your dog or cat. Just a really wonderful person and a wonderful artist. And the art 
for the yearly. I actually don't remember the name of our artist, um, but I can look that up and get it back to you. Fantastic. All right. And I think anybody else have any questions? I've got to say the um, Wings Over Florida pro program is a lot of fun to do. It's just even individually, it's just to challenge yourself to get to the different levels or for your kids or grandkids. Yeah, it was originally designed mostly for kids, um, but it turns out that everybody really likes getting artwork to hang up in their homes. Okay, Deborah has a question. Um, where do you like to see prothonotary warblers? Oh, I, I like to see them everywhere. Um, around here in the Panhandle, um, I usually go out to sort of the marshier places um, out in the Apalachicola Forest area. Um, Rowlett's Creek is a place that I really like to go if any of you ever get the chance to go there. Um, it's owned by Coastal Plains Institute and they do a lot of really cool work there. Um, yeah, but they're definitely my favorite. <laughs> they are. You may have already answered this, but how many um, properties are on the Great Florida Birding Trail currently? Ooh, um, currently we have 518. Wow. Yeah, so wherever you are, there's something close by. You can't even see one a day, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually thinking, let me know if you're interested in this, but in addition to our uh, birding and butterfly milestones, we were thinking about adding in a birding trail visitation milestone thing as well. That's cool. I don't know of anyone who's hit all 518 yet. And now of course we're gonna be adding more, so. Wow, that's a good challenge. <laughs> Ooh, what site on the trail offers the most species, non-migratory? I don't know that off the top of my head, but um, one project that I didn't mention that we're gonna be working on, um, just, mostly sort of for our own use. Um, so I mentioned that we use eBird data to look at bird populations and bird trends. But one thing that we're gonna be try to do this year is look at trends in birders. Um, so where people are going um, and when, and so we're gonna try to get that data. But while we're doing that, we can, we're gonna be pulling data from all of our birding trail sites. Um, so it'll be easy to, to look at what species are there um, year round and which sites have the most species. Pretty cool. Yeah. Though some sites, they have more birds than are reported on eBird. Get to those underbirded sites because there might be some real gems out there. Very true. It might not be that the birds aren't there, it's just people aren't visiting as much. Any other questions from our audience? That was an awesome program. Oh, well, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, if you have any other questions that you think of, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll pop that into the chat too here. Pretty easy to remember. It's just first name, last name at myfwc.com. We did have one more question. Is there a better time of year to visit the birding? Oh. Um, Florida in general, not right now. <laughs> Actually, I mean, now things are starting to pick up again for migration, but definitely migration is a wonderful time to come. The dead of summer isn't necessarily people's favorite time to get out and about, but in any season, there's going to be something interesting to see. I will have to say in the summer, if you go to the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, you get the little bitterns are playing everywhere. The least bitterns that you don't get to see when it gets a little busier and they, they take, they leave, you know. So those are, if you really like to see those birds are very cute. And I think Linda asked, is there a direct link to the guides? So unfortunately, um, as somebody else mentioned in the chat too, 
the FWC publication ordering page is a little bit tricky. Um, so I think I, if people want to duck out, um, of course, that's fine. But let me share with you really quickly, um, just two short steps to get there, not necessarily the most intuitive. But the link that I sent you guys to the publications page uh, has this place to go to the publications order form. So if you click on that, you come to yet another complicated drop down menu. Um, and you can search for everything that the agency provides. There's a lot of really cool stuff in, from the different divisions and sections, um, lots of stuff. But if you go to bird watching, which really should be wildlife viewing because we're, we're trying to get people looking at everything um, and then search, you'll find this link right here um, and you just check off the ones that you're interested. And when you submit the selections, it'll take you to a page to put in your address. But if anybody has any questions about that or can't get it to work, you can always email me um, either to ask how the publications page work or just send me your address and I'll get them shipped out. I think you're going to get a lot of orders. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, we're going to have some busy days of fulfillment ahead. Yeah, they're much better in people's hands and out in the field than they are sitting in our warehouse. Exactly. Exactly. I know I'm going to go on and order, order a few. Okay. I'm excited for the signs at the wildlife drive. Yay. I'm really excited to have them up too. Mm -hmm. And I think Pat had one more question and she was saying, do you use the eBird voice recognition or voice identification? Oh, I've I, never. I think maybe, do you think maybe Merlin? Yeah, Merlin. Is, is it the same group. Yeah, the Merlin voice, bird voice recognition or song recognition the sound sound recognition which is very very new mm -hmm. i have not used it myself before but i'm really excited i know that technology just keeps getting better and better um it's just so it's so cool what we can do with uh machine learning it's it, as i said i think it's kind of magical <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool it's not a hundred percent but it's 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 very helpful when you're out in the field Kind of, and it's good to try to guess what it is and then then record it and see, you know, if you got it. Good way to learn. And Alan's, he says it works great. He's been using it. So. It is fun. We'll see how it does with Warbler chips. That is yet to come. <laughs> well, good. So we look forward to everyone joining us next week. Um, for our bird chat. And in the meantime, um, be sure you go to our Facebook page um, be, because we're adding events all the time. So you'll start seeing that. We got some really fun ones coming up. <laughs>